Oh, my heart is just so full looking out at all of you and thinking how grateful I am um, to Pat's family, to Julia and Virginia and Leora and William and Jonathan, thank you so much for your generosity in letting us do this. It's, it's obvious just looking around this room how, many, how important it is for us as a community to be able to, um, to bear witness to the, just the extraordinary impact that Pat had on all of our lives. It's important far beyond the words that any of us will say here today just to be able to be with each other and to bear witness to that impact. And I know so many of you have come from so far uh, to do that. When I got on the elevator to just a few minutes ago with Roger Dworkin and Ann Gellis and Tom Shornhorst and Len Fromm and Frank Motley, in other words, I, I walked back in time with uh, <laughs> in our elevator and I just thought how wonderful it felt to see um, see those tremendous friends and how far so many people had come and what an extraordinary amount of love and respect people feel for Pat. We'll, we'll always feel for Pat. So it might, it might be enough for me simply to say and not say anything else that I valued Pat's opinion on any legal issue more than anyone else's in the world. And I'm, I'm sure that's true of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us. So thank you uh, so much for letting, us, for letting us have this opportunity to be together. So what I would like to do is um, invite us all to um, settle in for a bit and to think about the, uh, the many ways in which Pat Bode was, uh, was a part of our lives. And to help us do that, we have a number of people who are going to share their memories with us. And what I would like to do is invite them just to come up in the order that they are in the program, if, if that would be okay. So, Greg Zeller, that would start with you. Thank you, Dean, and uh, thanks for this uh, honor uh, to be asked to come down on behalf of the, the state of Indiana that uh, Professor Bode uh, meant so much to. Uh, all of us. The Attorney General uh, is uh, sworn to serve the state to the best of my skill and ability. And according to Professor Bode, that was about a B. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but luckily, luckily I'm a very good appellate lawyer. <laughs> I did get an A in appellate law, so, uh, uh, and I'll speak until the red light comes on. <laughs> but as an appellate lawyer, I always uh, fill the brief, uh, and I've written a little something that I thought would uh, help form my thoughts, uh, and they're, they're quite full. Uh, Professor Bode meant a lot to uh, the state of Indiana, uh, so I write a tribute uh, to Pat Bode with thanks from a grateful state. Uh, my singular focus as Indiana's Attorney General is the best interest of the state of Indiana. Uh, this is my mantra, my North Star. Uh, it guides my every action. And it's in that capacity that I come to pay tribute uh, to Professor Bode. Uh, the lawyer, scholar, teacher, yes, but, uh, but from my perspective, a man who contributed much uh, to serve the best interests of our state. Indiana's Chief Justice Randy Shepard uh, wrote in volume 86 of the Indiana Law Journal that was dedicated to Professor Bode's memory uh, that the professor had written extensively on the virtues and strengths of Indiana's Constitution in arguing that our constitutional law, quote, warranted a higher rank in American legal discourse. Uh, professor Bode's essay entitled Indiana's Constitution in a Nation of Constitutions uh, is now reprinted for visitors to the first Indiana State Capitol in Corden. Uh, 
uh, where our Constitution was written. Others uh, here today will undoubtedly speak of the lasting legacy of Professor Bode from the many students to whom he imparted his teaching and his intellectual rigor and to those of us in the legal profession. You can add me to the many that he taught, uh, although, again, not uh, necessarily the best of his students academically, um, but one that was inspired to serve this state and the public as a vocation, uh, one that learned to call upon others to serve uh, the best interests of our state. And there were many occasions where I had the need to call upon Professor Bode uh, to offer his legal analysis to the Attorney General um, and his um, ask to write opinions. Uh, these are, uh, I won't tell you which ones. Um, <laughs> he was always the ghost uh, writer of a few tough opinions. And he always provided counsel and confidence on issues of some uh, public weight. He always agreed to serve and never failed to offer insight and guidance along with his sound legal analysis. And some of his work uh, still remains in my desk today. Uh, Pat Bode's influence and contribution to the state of Indiana extends deep into the foundations of our jurisprudence. Uh, this influence will continue to reach into the future as a result of his writings and teaching. When I thought about the vast impact, impact Professor Bode has had and will continue to have on the state of Indiana, it occurred to me that he can be compared to the great constitutional elm in Corden, where the Constitution was first written in 1816. Uh, you might recall that the Constitutional Convention delegates met under the shade of the giant elm, uh, and just as its roots reached deep into our Hoosier soil and, and its limbs and branches and canopy created shade and protection, the Indiana Constitution drew upon the collective wisdom of our state's founders and it provided the protection of liberties, civil rights, and freedoms through a system of laws uh, to all persons in our state. Now, the constitutional elm in Corden died in 1925 and was cut down, but it still remains a valuable piece of our state's history. And a piece of its hardwood encases a copy of our state's first constitution and is displayed in the rotunda of the state house in our current capital in Indianapolis. Professor Bode's contributions to our jurisprudence are a link back to our historic past and provide support for future developments in Indiana law that will spring from his intellectual influence. His legacy will serve as a symbol to our state's constitutional heritage as much as the constitutional elm itself. Hoosiers owe much thanks to Pat Bode for his service in the best interests of the state of Indiana. Thank you. For five years, Pat wrote about wine for Bloom Magazine. There are quite a few wine columns in quite a few publications, but Patrick's column was different because he wasn't just writing about wine, he was writing about life. He did so with insight and humor and with a common touch that made what he wrote engaging for everyone in the community, people knowledgeable about wine, people seeking wine knowledge, and people with no interest in the subject at all, <laughs> like me. <laughs> Yet we could all learn something from this fine, uncommon man. Patrick instinctively knew how to grab a reader, and often his calling began with a vignette that was so enticing, so surprising, that you really couldn't turn away from the page. For example, who could resist this opening from Patrick's February 2010 column? I was in an expensive Detroit restaurant near a man with an expensive suit who was ordering expensive wine 
in a loud voice. <laughs> Somehow I knew, and so did the sommelier, if I read his body language right, that the wine would be rejected when it got there. <laughs> I didn't feel sorry for the management when this happened, since their selling price for the first bottle would have been fair for two of them. I did feel sorry for the woman at the table. Her body language made it clear she didn't want another bottle of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild at all. What she seemed to want was another pink cosmopolitan <laughs> and a different companion. <laughs> Here's another slice of life opener, which is Pure Patrick, from his August 2009 column on the joys of setting up a wine cellar. Vanity is one reason to start a wine cellar. At a dinner in Chicago last year, I was seated next to a couple way above my income level. When I later Googled them to see what they did, <laughs> the only activity I found was their giving money to charity in $20 million chunks. <laughs> Probably I should have Googled their grandparents. <laughs> As the conversation wound inevitably to their Lake Geneva house, I learned that it was so cold when they entertained in the wine cellar that guests were uncomfortable. The problem was solved by buying used mink coats at a, at a vintage clothing store and keeping them in the cellar. Apparently, the very rich, much like my college fraternity brothers, enjoy putting on ratty clothes and getting drunk in the basement. <laughs> This opening zinger from October 2002. If Gwyneth Paltrow wants to meet me near the Spanish Steps for a glass of Brunello, I think I can clear my calendar. <laughs> on occasion, Pat dispensed straightforward advice on living well. In August in 2007, he penned a column about beer that I've seen cut out and adorning refrigerators around town. In that column, he wrote, wherever one finds good beer, the biggest mistake is to drink it solemnly. Of course, it has alcohol and must be respected. Of course, the skill and imagination of its brewer is a wondrous thing. Yet the joy to be had here is not sniffing, swirling, erudite criticism, or snobbery. The point of getting together with a few friends and a few beers is to connect with them and with the bounty of the earth. In parenthesis, Pat added, if there's no singing involved, you may need better beer. <laughs> or cooler friends. <laughs> there were also times when this essentially private man wrote about his family life. This is one of my favorite passages. When my son was six, we'd all slipped away for a short vacation. When we got there, Jonathan became increasingly agitated as he carefully checked out the situation, peering into the empty refrigerator, opening doors, and climbing around. I thought at first he was missing the new puppy we had left at home. Finally, I got it. He was afraid of hunger. When he beamed, pulled me over to the telephone and said, it's okay, Dad, there will be pizza. <laughs> when I repeated that story to Jonathan years later, this is still Patrick writing, he replied that I was exactly the same. On vacation, at the first trip to the grocery in the nearest lakeside town, I disappeared anxiously for 20 minutes, reappearing with a couple of bottles of decent wine and obvious relief. <laughs> In a 2007 column entitled, The Good Old, Bad Old Days, Patrick wrote about his present state of being. He summed it up this way. So I've got it made these days, and I will continue to, so long as Indiana University believes that modern may be well and good, but there's no substitute 
for a properly aged professor. <laughs> we miss Patrick at Bloom. Our readers miss Patrick. I think the law profession was very fortunate to claim him because I think had he pursued a career as a writer, he would have been a really great one. As it was, he was pretty damn good. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Bode. <laughs> I had forgotten that story, but <laughs> that sounds about right on both our counts. Uh, I was just talking to my mom earlier today about how I think we, in the family, uh, inherited all of his traits, his better traits and his worst traits. Uh, I got some of his uh, procrastination, but uh, I... Once, once Dad started to, uh, to write more, as it happened with the column, and um, he would start to tell us about little ideas he had for stories, I think there was a, a mystery novel that never quite got it to, got on the page, but I felt relief, you know. Felt like a, an apple next to the tree. There are, um, <laughs> there are a lot of people here. <laughs> Some of whom I know, and many of whom I don't, which is not surprising because uh, over the decades, I know my father touched many lives through classes and through writing and um, a number of ways. And uh, many of you here knew my father for longer than I ever got the chance to. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't pretty jealous because I know there are a lot of good stories out there. I've heard some of them. <laughs> um, in January and February, we I at least personally took to uh, Googling him every couple of days. And there were a lot of stories that got posted here and there, comments, and, and a lot of things that, that uh, Dad was probably too humble to tell us, but pretty cool stuff. Um, I still remember um, the story that Dad used to tell, that when uh, I was very small, he liked to put me on his forearm. So he'd sit me there with my head here, and he could fit me there. Dad liked that story a lot, too. <laughs> Good to tell it, no matter how old I was or you know, college graduation, he was like, you know. <laughs> That's right. Dad did like to take me to the park, too, and um, soak up the attention. But uh, Dad, I think, uh, I know for me, and I know for us, and I know for many of you, I think, uh, you knew that uh, he always had your back in a lot of ways. Um, I still remember telling Dad about a, a story idea I had where I wanted to write something about ghost towns. And I didn't know much about them. And I started to ask him about uh, the law involved. And he said he wasn't quite sure. And then when I got home that night, there was an email. My dad had Lexis Nexus, uh, a relevant uh, precedent. I said an amicus brief, or so I don't even know. I didn't know what I was looking at. Uh, he never answered a question with "I don't know." You know, it was always it was always the best you ever get was a a good guess and then some well cited sources later on. But um, I don't know. We we all knew him in different ways, and I know that a lot of you knew him in a professional setting or in a uh, setting of mentorship. And I have heard so many cool stories about what that was like, and I can only really imagine it. Um, even now, I remember some night finding uh, the manuscript for his book on the Constitution written in Corydon, and knowing nothing still. I made it a couple chapters in, but you know, <laughs> without any knowledge of what I was even reading. But he was so engaging and so smart. And um, I don't know. He was a lot of things to me. and to many of us. He was smart and kind and wise and sweet and, um, and brave. And uh, to me, at least, he was a titan. And I love him dearly. I know many people in this room do. And it's an honor to see you all. Thank you.
it's honor it's an honor for me to be here to speak about Pat Bode. But I don't know what to say. I've lost my memory. Not just the wispy memories that we all lose over time, but a portion of the data bank that holds my memories. That data bank being Pat Bode's brain. <laughs> Pat's memory was so extraordinary that eventually I stopped being surprised when he came up with things that I had long forgotten saying. <laughs> I think it was said about John von Neumann that he was sent to Earth to learn what humans knew and report back to his planet. <laughs> Pat was on that mission too. <laughs> Pat absorbed it all. It was a compendious catalog all indexed and ready for instantaneous replay whenever the situation called for it. Not only could Pat recall ideas, he could usually express them more cogently and elegantly than had their original authors. Once during our lunchtime discussion in the faculty lounge, someone asked, what could be said from the perspective of critical legal studies? Pat responded immediately with a perfectly formed paragraph of critical analysis, an unspottable counterfeit of what a critical legal scholar might have written, or wished he'd written. <laughs> All here today know that Pat's gifts didn't stop with ideas of others. Original insights poured from him in reflexive reaction to whatever he heard. His response to a speech was usually more illuminating than the headlined presentation. I once asked Pat to be a panelist providing comments on a paper, and he said he'd be happy to help out, and did he ever. Pat could have ripped that paper to shreds, but that was not his style. He found wonderful points in the work, some of which were actually there. <laughs> <laughs> and then elaborated on them. Out of the hundreds of conference panels that I have seen, that was the single most constructive commentary that I've ever witnessed. Count yourself among the luckiest of law students if you were assigned to his class. Having attended elsewhere, I had no chance to be his student, but I did once pretend to be one. Shortly after arriving here, I asked some of our best teachers whether I could audit a class. These teachers, many of whom are in this room, in the supportive spirit of IU, were all happy to oblige, and I spent a few delightful hours learning teaching techniques by watching them work with and work on our students. But observing Pat's teaching did not help me out at all. I sat in the back of the room and I learned some constitutional law and I learned some constitutional history. I also learned that I would never ever be able to teach like Pat Bode. I was daunted. Nothing Pat did was something I could mimic. It was wonderful. One interesting idea followed another. Connections emerged from thin air and all without any notes. I'd have to find other models to emulate. This one was far beyond me. Dictionaries define scholar to be a learned or erudite person. That was Pat. His knowledge was encyclopedic. Often back in the day when the faculty had time for brown bag lunches together, an argument would pass back and forth among some of us until, in a lull, Pat would pipe up with facts and law that none of us knew. And that would settle the issue. <laughs> I knew better than to argue with Pat. We had lots of discussions, but not arguments. When we differed, I would say something, he would correct me, <laughs> and that would be the end of it. I do recall one instance, though, in an argument about addiction to gambling, when I refused to accept his view of the matter. No more, no more than 15 minutes after I'd returned to my office from lunch, I got an email message from Pat with a link to a source indicating that I was right for once. He was almost never wrong, but was eager to research the matter and acknowledge it if he was. I frequently darkened his door to consult him on a point of constitutional law on which you all know his knowledge was profound. He was always gracious in his response, inviting me in and motioning with a slow sweep of his hand for me to take a seat. He had plenty of time to help, and after I left, he would routinely follow up with citations to both ancient and new sources that would help me pursue the point further. He was old school in manner, while completely current in mind. Pat could also be, as you've already heard tonight, very funny. 
When he spoke to students in our last lecture series, Pat said that he was lucky to teach constitutional law because he did not have to make jokes. All he had to do was read aloud what, just, what, justice, what justices had written, and the audience would dissolve in laughter. And then he proved the point, reading, reading from the United States reports. I'm sure his students did laugh often, but not because the Supreme Court opinions are so amusing. If Pat were here, he would have pulled a better story from my memory, and he'd have told it with insights that I cannot conjure up, and he'd have made you laugh. But he is not. I've lost my memory and colleague and friend. Our school has lost a splendid scholar, and we've all lost a brilliant teacher. from my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say about Pat Bode? What can't I say about Pat Bode? One sentence says it all. Pat Bode was the best. He was the best at everything he was. He was the best at everything he did. He was the best teacher. Everybody knows that. There are teachers with intellect. There are teachers with knowledge. <clears throat> there are teachers with forensic ability. There are a few with all three. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Pat combined those three better than anyone. And he capped them with dedication, grace, and gentle humor. He challenged and inspired the best students better than anyone else, while nonetheless, or while at the same time, expanding the horizons and maintaining the love of all. Of course, his teaching did not stop at the classroom door. His colleagues were also blessed to be his students. Never by fiat, never because Pat thrust his views upon us, but because we had the wisdom to, on our, to seek his guidance on our own in order to improve ourselves as teachers and scholars. Pat had the best mind. <clears throat> he knew everything. And more importantly, he knew how to think about everything. His interests were Catholic, his conceptions profound, and of course, we asked, and he shared. He always shared. Pat was the best of the citizen scholar. He served the university <clears throat> in countless capacities, including as head of the faculty council. He served Bloomington as the chair of the committee on public Sa the Public Safety Commission. He served the state, as we have already heard today, as advisor to governors and to attorney generals and to other public officials. He served the bar as chair of the state board of law examiners. He was a true public servant. As those of us who knew him can attest, Pat was the best in matters of taste. Food, wine, he knew it all. But most of all, Pat Bode was the best friend. He was my best friend for 43 years. And I know that I am not alone. What does that mean? Does it mean that we went palling around going to one amusement or another? <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> it means that when we were young, Pat shared with me his delight in being given the great gift of getting paid to do the world's best job. 
so that after we would walk down to the bank to deposit our paychecks, those were the old, old days, he always stopped to buy himself a treat to celebrate. <laughs> a cigar, a paperback book, something to symbolize how lucky he knew we were. He shared everything like that. His humor, his grace, his library, his intellect, his support, and most of all, his time. Pat Bode, for all his incredible work, never was too busy for a friend. Advice, guidance, help solving an intellectual puzzle, just talking. It didn't matter. Pat was always there for a minute, an hour, or all day. I used to fill my days talking to Pat Bode. After I left Bloomington, to my regret, <clears throat> I didn't do that anymore. And now I can't. Pat has shared with me for the last time. But what he shared remains with me forever. The gift of friendship from a man who was the best. Well, Roger's difficulties remind me of one of my favorite lines from Pat, which is, living with a small child is like living over an open sewer. Yes. <laughs> occasions to think about that over the years. <laughs> you know, one of, one, of the, uh, one of the most enormous pleasures of being the dean of this law school is that I have the opportunity to be a little bit of a conduit between the school and its graduates over the years. And every single place I have gone since Pat died, the first conversation I have is about Pat, the first. Yeah. Students, his students have needed to acknowledge um, their gratitude for his teaching. Students who had not seen him in decades felt his loss. And for them, the loss was of uh, a way to think about the world and a passion for the law that just stayed with him for all that time. He was the best teacher I ever had, and I had a lot of good teachers, and a lot of them are sitting in this room, and you were all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the, he was the best. Um, Pat has given me many occasions, actually, to think about what makes a great teacher, and I was listening to Jeff's struggle with sitting in the classroom one, once and trying to figure out how you would possibly replicate that. And you're right, it's, it's absolutely uh, not replicable. But, but it is teaching. And so, the, so I've had to think a lot about it. I've thought about it both as his student. I thought about it a lot. Um, I thought about it when I came here as a young teacher, an impossibly um, naive teacher, uh, thinking about trying how I could ever possibly try to teach the subjects that Pat taught, and lamenting the fact that students would have to have me for some of their classes instead of him, um, and thinking about it when he, uh, when he retired after a fashion, when he was given this school's teaching award, the first time ever lifetime teaching award, I think. So I've had a lot of time to think about it. And um, 
And then the Law Journal asked me if I would write something in his honor. And I apologize for, for to those of you who've heard me say these words before, but, but to me it's, it's important to say exactly and precisely what I mean about this. So some teachers are, are just unfailingly kind and generous, and some are consistent in maybe even gentle in setting uncompromisingly high standards. And some embody a set of inspirational professional values that kind of coax their students into understanding how important the work it is that they're preparing to do. And Pat was all of that. But what was really most distinctive about Pat as a teacher was the quality of his mind, and it was just magnificent. His mind was just beautiful in its, um, in its nobility and in its brilliance. And many things about those two words seem exact and precisely right for Pat. Both words come to English from the old French. Need I say more? <laughs> Brilliance describes, I think we're all sort of searching for some metaphors here. Brilliance describes exactly the way his mind made diamonds out of coal and then pierced them with light, creating these dazzling spectra of colors. He took the visible and the ordinary, and he created and showed us the invisible and the extraordinary. So nobility of mind begins, begins for me to suggest the capaciousness and the loftiness of Pat's intellect. But I, too, was drawn to a metaphor, because when I was looking at these words, I discovered the noble metals and the noble metals are called noble metals because they are rare and they are incorruptible. So I think about Pat's mind as a brilliant set in gold, which is the most noble of the metals. Henry Fielding wrote, the jeweler knows the finest brilliant requires a foil. <coughs> Who were we? <laughs> What was really most distinctive about Pat's teaching was the way he revealed that magnificent mind to us in action in the course of his classes. He did it in a quiet, quiet way. He did it with humor and humility. He did it without flashiness. I think he recognized that if he'd unleashed it all, at one point, the rest of us would have been just too daunted. But in doing this, he demonstrated how a brilliant legal mind unravels and unspools and scrutinizes and frames and reframes and reassembles really the hardest legal problems he could think to present to us. That's what was great about those classes. And as a student and as his colleague, I was just dazzled. One of his former students said, I felt I was sitting at the feet of Aristotle. <laughs> he made simple things complex. He made them maddeningly complex sometimes. His, his gift wasn't really to make complex things simple. It was to make students appreciate and relish complexity. And to relish difficulty and to relish nuance. I said when he uh, got the teaching award, he didn't, he didn't organize taxonomies. That wasn't really his way. Rather, what he did was he thought out loud and he thought beautifully, and he invited us to do the same. And he, his confidence that we could maybe do that was just what we lived up to. And I can tell you that some of the school's most distinguished alumni really credit all of their success to that simple requirement in Pat's classes. The other metaphor I always think of is alchemy when I think of Pat. 
you know, our students were complaining in here the other day about our internet being down. The last thing you needed in one of Pat's classes was access to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> what you really needed to be able to do in that class was have the guts to put your, your, your pencil down, turn your laptop off, and, and listen. And if you did that, what had seemed alchemical before became possible. You began to learn how you could turn an idea just slightly or subtly or subtly. And if you engaged with that over time and you listened, he would show you how. And of course, not as well as he could do it, but um, well enough to start your professional life and well enough for many of the graduates of this school to go on to incredible careers. And to look back at that teaching as the thing that set them on their paths. And from any possible area of the law. So I think this is why his students still think of themselves as his students. You know, I still, to this day, I always did think of myself as Pat's student. And I always will. And how lucky, how lucky was I? And how lucky were so many of us in this room? Oh. I want to thank everyone for being here. Some people um, put together a video of Pat, and I'd like to show that at this time. Born in Independence, Kansas in 1943, Patrick Lewis Bode was raised in Topeka, where his mother was a professor of French literature and his father was a physician. Pat's parents had met in Paris while his mother Jane was studying and working as an au pair in the home of Nobel laureate Jean Perrin. André Bode was a member of Perrin's circle of friends and the couple met and married in 1936. Shortly before their first child, Richard, was born in 1938, to ensure his citizenship, Jane returned briefly to the United States, but left France again when World War II began. The couple was finally reunited after André, a member of the French resistance during the war, was released to the Americans following his capture and imprisonment by the Germans. Together again, the family lived for several years in Norton, Kansas, but soon settled in the intellectual community of Topeka. They lived next door to famed psychiatrist Carl Menninger, and as Pat grew, Menninger was among Pat's early influences, giving him books to read and talking to him about important social and political issues of the day. Pat and his brother attended public schools in Topeka, and in Pat's junior year of high school, he was invited to participate in a National Science Foundation program in math. The following year, at the age of 17 and without a high school diploma, he was invited to begin college at the University of Kansas. Pat received his undergraduate degree in economics and history from the University of Kansas after three and a half years, graduating in January of 1964. Kansas Law School offered him a place in a pilot program enabling students to begin law school mid-year. Pat began that January at Kansas graduating in 1966, first in his class and the editor of the Kansas Law Review. Following law school, Pat and his wife Deborah moved to Milwaukee where he joined the firm of Foley, Salmon, and Lardner. Their first child, Virginia, was born in 1967 while they lived in Milwaukee. But after only 18 months of practice, Pat's former dean at Kansas persuaded him to accept a graduate fellowship at Harvard Law School. After one year, Pat received an LLM in the emerging field of international law, and it was at Harvard that he decided to enter teaching. 
As fate would have it, in the fall of 1967, the new dean of the law school at Indiana University, Burnett Harvey, came to Harvard seeking new faculty members. After an interview with Dean Harvey and a visit to Bloomington, Pat accepted a position to teach commercial transactions at IU. But shortly before Pat arrived, the dean called him to ask if he would instead teach constitutional law because of a faculty resignation. Pat was thrilled. In June of 1968, Pat and his family settled in Bloomington. In 1971, Pat and Deborah had a second daughter, Leora. Through the years, Pat gained a reputation for his remarkable ability in the classroom. The hallmark of his teaching was that it transcended the fundamentals of the subject, blending history, philosophy, popular culture, and current events to stretch the students to examine established institutions in light of new ideas and to consider precedents within the context of the times. Uh, I mean, that's, that's really kind of the basic point. It's, 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 it's extremely important in my mind for you to understand that a course in a law school is not, I hope anyway, is not a process by which the professor's accumulated wisdom, insight, and knowledge is transmitted to you. So you can write it down in a notebook and memorize it, and then you'll know it. You know, I mean, that's just not the process of teaching. I don't teach constitutional law. Well, you all know that. Maybe some of you have had me for You know I don't. But the most important point is, which might surprise you, I don't even try. Uh, I try to teach people, you know, how to, how to do the stuff that you do when you do constitutional law, which involves thinking and talking and laughing and crying and working and, you know, thinking some more and then stopping. Uh, that's how you, that's, that, that, that's, that's the whole point of it. Because of the transformative nature of his teaching, Pat was held in the highest regard by his students winning the university's Ulysses G. Weatherly Distinguished Teaching Award in 1973, the law school's Gavel Award in 1980 and 2011, its Wallace Teaching Award in 1990, and a Lifetime Achievement Award in Teaching in 2008. In 2001, he was named the inaugural Ralph Fuchs Professor of Law and Public Service. Throughout his years of teaching, students marveled at his mastery of the material, his dynamic style, and his quick wit. But it was his ability to inspire students and to make them feel empowered that set Pat apart. In the law school, he was the advisor to the Indiana Law Journal for many years and participated on virtually every committee, chairing most. But beyond that, he was a centering force within the faculty a thoughtful counsel, a discerning voice of balance that influenced every important decision made at the school. But Pat's influence went far beyond the law school. He was an active scholar contributing articles and book chapters on a wide variety of topics. He served as special counsel to the governor of Indiana and the Indiana Attorney General, was the president of the State Board of Law Examiners, and served on the board of the Indiana Equal Justice Foundation. In addition, Pat served on numerous university committees and academic boards. Exciting ideas and important causes often took Pat beyond the classroom to do appellate work in the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit and the United States Supreme Court. And Pat was always available to his former students who needed advice on their cases. But as busy as he was, Pat's greatest joy was his family. In 1981, Pat married Julia Lamber, who was also a member of the law school's faculty at IU. Their first son, William, was born in 1982, and Jonathan was born in 1987. Through the years, Pat's two daughters, Virginia and Leora, have presented Pat with three precious grandchildren, Eleanor, 17, Henry, almost three, and James, nearly one. Whenever possible, the family traveled to Europe Pat and Julia would bike through the countryside of Italy and France. Pat's older sister, Jabot, still lives in Marseille. In his leisure, Pat was a gourmet cook. Probably because of his French heritage, he specialized in the cooking of France, and he was a connoisseur of fine wine. Friends often sought his advice on what wine to buy, and he wrote a regular feature on wine in the local magazine, Bloom. 
few people leave such a legacy, a loving and accomplished family, over 15,000 devoted students, scores of caring colleagues, and a university and state that have been made greater from his dedication, judgment, and commitment. Such a legacy is born of a lifetime of special relationships that were important to Pat and treasured by all who knew him. No, but, but so the, the, point of that, the point of that transmission isn't there, but what, what, what teaching is and has been for me uh, is uh, it's, it's a personal relationship. It's not the transmission of information. It is to be a teacher and to be a student. It's to be in a relationship that, if it works, shapes your lives, both of yours, forever. And it has worked for, for me a number of times, and I, I, I can only infer from the fact that there are more than 50 students here that it's worked for a number of you, too, as a kind of, a kind of personal relationship. The idea that we, we share. We share a goal of justice. We share the belief that law and legal analysis leads to justice when done properly, and we share the belief that it is our responsibility as members of the lawyer of the legal profession, whether professors or judges, practicing lawyers, to, to use the profession to implement the idea of law to achieve justice. You know, you share that. We share that as a kind of a background of a personal relationship. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, so uh, seeing some of you here, I, I, I just have to say this in a moment of weakness. It really and genuinely warms me to the bottom of my dark, cold lawyer's heart. <laughs> and for this, I just thanks a million. Thanks a million back. <laughs> it, it's, so, it's so wonderful to see you all here today. And I know everybody wants to keep talking. And I think we need uh, to fill Jonathan in on the rest of those stories that he, he, he wants to hear. So I'd like to invite you all upstairs to the third floor uh, where maybe we can have a little wine. Okay.